globalization, the flat world, outsourcing, free trade. Each of these phrases is a flashpoint in one of the most heated and fascinating debates of our time. Is globalization a force for good or is it wrecking the economic foundation of rich nations like America by sending our wealth and prosperity overseas? With us is Gabor Steingart, the Washington correspondent for Der Spiegel magazine, whose best-selling book, The War for Wealth, has just been released in English. Gabor, welcome to Foreign Exchange. Hello. Great to be here. Thank you. Why does the flat world get such a bad rap in your book? I think the, the flat world is, um, is the wrong picture because we had a flat world in former times uh, when we competing against Western countries. If we had uh, uh, at the beginning of the global economy, we were competing against Canada, the US, Western Europe, and we, were, uh, we had a competition between nations which were working under the same uh, set of rules and regulations. And then the unthinkable happened. Um, another 1.5 billion people came to the world labor market and now the western workforces were competing against people under a different set of rules and regulations and that's why i said the flat world is crashed it's for most of the part of the western workforce right now it's a rocky road do you think that it was fair before then yes it was a competition um, but it was a fair competition because we, you have to see, let, let me be very clear at that point, we, we sent our kids to school, not down the coal mine. We tried to protect our environment, uh, not to pollute it. You put a, a guy like me uh, on TV, not, in, not down to prison. So uh, we are facing now a lot of um, competition from countries which are not members of the democratic capitalistic club. By that you mean the Asian economies who have benefited um, from globalization and who presumably, I mean, you make the, the argument in your book that they're taking jobs that belonged to Americans and American wealth is being exported overseas and this is to the detriment of America's lower and middle class which is being squeezed. And these are all problems which have to be laid directly at the door of globalization? I think it's a new problem because we have never seen this competition against a guided economy. The Soviet Union was a guided economy, but we, we were not in competition with them. They were a closed job economy. They were never, never um, go to the world labor market and also their products. We, we don't buy them, we don't sell them anything. So that was a closed job economy. Now we are in, in a free uh, market economy and uh, the free market in China is not a free market economy in our style. That's all uh, what I see. And if you, if you agree to this, you have to find uh, another way of politics, another way of trade politics. All the free trade stuff doesn't work anymore. I'm a, I'm a diehard believer in free trade. I think it will bring peace and prosperity. But if your opponent is a guided economy, you have to find another style. You have to bring politics back on the trade table. Right, so how would you propose to make it freer and fairer then? Um, first of all, I think we have to, to understand that one country cannot fight back all the, all the things uh, going, going uh, on outside. So um, I advocate very strongly to have a better cooperation between the Western countries. I think we cooperate in military issues and I think we have to cooperate also in economic issues. So to, uh, the question is who integrates whom into his system? We have to educate the Asian countries and to integrate them in our system to cooperation between the Western countries means the Western uh, Europe and the US. We are together only 10% of world population and we have to, to look at our set of rules and regulation, Kyoto Protocol, the ban of child labor, consumer protection, uh, women's rights, all this, also political liberty. So is, are you sort of making a, a roundabout case for protectionism? I mean, is that, is that the solution? <laughs> No, that's not the solution and that's not what, I, what I'm advocating. I think we have to look for a third way. Uh, this is, for me, a broken record both on both sides of the aisles, the free traders, the diehard free traders and the diehard protectionism. We have to look for a way, a third way, which I would call managed trade. We have to understand that trade is not a matter of beliefs, but a matter of interests. And there are a lot of interests at stake interests of normal ordinary people maybe of one third right now of the american workforce is is infected by all these problems and we are in the early morning hours so the middle class will see uh, what is coming up with their jobs 
And uh, but you know so the arguments that people in favor of globalization make that they say that for all of the jobs that go overseas that end up going to India or to China, jobs are also created and wealth is generated and those, that wealth comes back into the United States. So it's a, a win-win situation. No, it's definitely not. We, what we see outside right now, it's not a continuation of, of our past. It's, it's a new present. And what we see right now is a, it's a big shift of uh, prosperity and political power. Twenty years later, everybody will understand what's going on. It's a, the fastest growth rates we have ever seen in world history, what we see in China. India is following very close, a lot of Asian countries. And that means that that's the foundation of a new role model, of a new political superpower. And I don't think we, we should stop it. But we should frame the debate. We should fight for our interests and the consumers. I, I would like also to bring consumers back on the table. They have to understand one sentence. If their living room, if their house, if your apartment is looking like the storage room of the Asian export industry, you cannot expect that your working place is looking in the same way as an American workplace looks today. It will but, change. But what, what about the benefits, though, of globalization for economies like the United States and for European economies? I mean, w would you at least accept that there are, are some merits to globalization? A lot of, a lot of, and we, we should follow this path, but we, it's a matter of politics and we have to frame it. That means, uh, for example, that we should push them to underwrite the Kyoto Protocol. It makes no sense to give the jobs, the, the factory jobs, the so-called old jobs uh, to, to China, to ship them overseas, and that's everything allowed, which was allowed in the United States maybe six years ago. We have to try to make international treaties, we have to try to educate them, to make sure that the same set of rules and regulations at the end of the way is allowed there than in this country. But how can, how can American workers be better prepared to meet these challenges, I mean, in terms of educating them or retraining them? I mean, is that something like that is already happening? I mean, do you see that as being the solution and, and uh, do you feel that it's even been successful? in the United States? No, it's, uh, when I look at the education system in the US, I see that at the, at the higher end, Harvard and all the big and great universities, uh, yes, I admire this system. Uh, at the lower end, if, you, uh, if I talk to Mr. Fenty here in Washington and he told me the, at a lunch that his big goal is to bring the school books uh, very early to the pupils, uh, not three months later as it normally done, uh, the only thing I could say, shame on you, that's not an educational system uh, where you can build a world leadership on. So you have to restore, I think, the American education system. Maybe you have to think the unthinkable and to double all the expenditure so for education. Our, our students are better prepared to yes. compete with Indian and Chinese and Brazilian workers yes. of the future. What do you think are the negatives um, for people in developing countries? How has globalization made their lives worse? For them, it's also different. A lot of people in China uh, they, they get a lot of more prosperity and wealth than they had 10 years before. But also these countries are interested to, to see some labor standards, some environmental standards. So I think we don't fight against these countries when we are asking for leveling the playing field. If we ask for more human rights, if we ask for, to allow trade unions to uh, negotiate the price of labor. So I think my that's, my book is a great success, by the way, in China. Uh, they, they love it, because I'm not, I'm not arguing against China. I'm arguing only against a very old-fashioned way in the Communist Party there. I think China has to use the big chance right now not to get only a market economy, but also to be member in the democratic capitalistic club. Gabor Steingart, thank you very much for coming on the program. Thank you. For